afternoon and thank you for coming. Today we kick off our Irish Heritage Month exhibit on a pictorial exhibit of the 1916 Easter Rising, as well as our Irish, Month, uh, Irish Heritage Month lecture series. We'd like to thank our Hibernian volunteers, Patricia Burke, Ann Collins, Bob Brothier, Rita Jensen, Jack Leahy, Catherine McCarty, and Bill and Jane Valentin for their assistance in helping to make this exhibit possible. Just to digress, this exhibit was purchased over 10 years ago, and they're purchased by the late and great David Burke. And back about five years ago, Pat Burke asked me six years ago what they were for. And I really tell you the truth, knew they were pictures of 1916, but I said, really? I didn't really know exactly what he had in mind. So I said, we'd use them this year, and so we've put those off. And those volunteers, we went out and we, of course, we have a very low budget. So what we do very seriously is we try to get the most money for our dollar. So I went to a local frame place. We found out it was going to cost $42 a piece to uh, frame each picture. And you have that number was going to be quite a bit of money. So um, I went out to another dealer and I found out he'd sell us the parts to the frames. So what you see there is the frames were put together part by part. So they really worked very hard. But they are great volunteers. Let's give them all a while. They did a fantastic job, and I think seriously that uh, they may be opening in the future a frame yeah. business. And if you can see any one of them, and they'll talk to you later about prices, we'll beat anyone's price. We'd like to note also that our Irish Heritage Month series events are partially funded by the Lawrence Cultural Council, and we'd like to thank them for their support. But also like to thank the Heritage State Park for hosting our exhibit and the White Fund for sponsoring today's lecture and Lawrence Community Access Television for videotaping today's events as well. We're hopeful that you will attend many of our upcoming events during Irish Heritage Month as we celebrate a great city and Irish culture at its best. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Eileen Burnell from the White Fund who will introduce our speaker. Eileen? Hey, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the White Fund trustees, myself, Jay Dowd, and Mary Guerrero O'Brien, I want to welcome all of you here today for this lecture. The White Fund has been hosting a lecture series here in the city of Lawrence for over 100 years. We're really glad to be carrying on that tradition and very proud to be partnering with the AOH today for this March Heritage um, Month speaker. The AOH has been a terrific institution here in Lawrence, really keeping so much of our Irish culture alive um, from this. Today's um, picture series to the speakers that they bring in, to their um, luncheons and their dinner dances, and just so many different things that they do for our community. The film festival, um, it's really a blessing for Lawrence to have a group that active and vibrant here in our city that does so many good things. So thank you to the AOH for all that you guys do for us, uh, and ladies, I don't mean <laughs> um, It is my honor, though, to introduce to you um, author Michael Quinlan today. He, his book is Irish Boston. It was published by Globe Press. It was re just reissued in its second edition. And he's also the editor of Classic Irish Stories. He's a former president of the Boston Irish Tourism Association, which he and his wife Colette co-founded in 2000 to promote the cultural history and heritage of Massachusetts and to strengthen the travel connections with New England, Ireland, and Canada. The association publishes a free magazine called Travel and Culture Guide three times a year. Quinlan created Boston's original Irish Heritage Trail, a three-mile walking trail in downtown Boston in the Back Bay, which includes 20 sites in downtown Boston and an additional 20 sites in Boston neighborhoods. He lives in Milton with his wife, Colette, and son, Devin. It is now my pleasure to introduce our featured guest speaker, Michael Quinlan, who will speak on Massachusetts and the 1916 Irish Rising. Good to see you all again. I feel like I'm kind of a local because I've been up here so many times. Um, you know, I've been coming up here since uh, the off-site of David Burke first invited me here in the 1980s. And this was back when the Hibernian Hall on Appleton Street was still around. 
and I taught the tin whistle for a couple of years and the wooden flute, and I gave a couple of Irish history courses. What I found on the history course, of course, was that most of the people in the class knew more about Irish history than I did, <laughs> which is a great testament to, I think, the Merrimack Valley and the, the wonderful traditions that are, that are here uh, in Lawrence especially. So I got a chance to take a quick look at the uh, wonderful exhibit of photographs from 1916. I just want to tell you a quick story, and I told this to Billy and Jim Leahy already. I got a call from Dave Burke in 2006. Now, I had known Dave for a long time, and I was used to getting calls from Dave and asking me to help on things, and I always said yes. But he left a message on my phone machine, and he said, Mike, you got a call. Give me a call. I, I got something big. This is big. You've, we're working on something up here, and I need your help. So I called him right back, and, and I said, Dave, how can I help? What do you got going? And he had this real urgent kind of tone of voice to his, his conversation, and he said, uh, a bunch of us up here are putting together some, some ideas for the centennial. And I said, the centennial of what? And he said, 1916. <laughs> this was in 2006. And I laughed with him about it several times since then. And, and, and uh, I always chuckle when I think of the memory. But upon reflection, I would say, I have a different sense about that now. Uh, now that Dave is gone and now that I'm a little older in the years myself, um, it seems to me that one of the great things that Dave and the AOH here and around the country uh, have always done is to kind of keep an eye out on the narrative that develops on Irish history and especially the Irish American role in Ireland's history. And so when I think back of, about Dave, um, one of the things that occurs to me is that he's really kind of, for, he was so forward thinking about what was going on. I feel like he had this experience with dealing with Ireland and Northern Ireland in the 1970s when there was a lot of uh, narrative and there was sort of a fight for the souls and minds of, of Irish Americans about uh, the, the troubles in Northern Ireland. And I just had the feeling that Dave kind of understood that in order to really clarify things, uh, you had to be in the game and you had to be in the conversation. And I think that's what he did so well and that everybody up here is doing so well. So uh, that's my Dave Burke story. Um, so today I was going to talk to you about the, uh, the Massachusetts role in the Irish Rising and to talk a little bit about how that took shape. I have an article in the current issue of Irish American Magazine, and it's called Boston and the Irish Rising, because the editor wanted to kind of pick the big cities around the country and, and have a focus there. But I said to her uh, halfway through the research, I said it's, it's better, uh, more aptly called Massachusetts, because come to find out, it wasn't only Boston that played a big role in kind of the narrative of the Irish Rising and, and the Irish American response to it. It was really cities all around the, the Commonwealth and, and, in fact, throughout the region. But when I was doing the research uh, at the BPL, it kept coming, becoming clear to me that places like Lawrence and Lowell, uh, Haverhill, Brockton, uh, Attleboro, New Bedford, Fall River, Chicopee, Holyoke, Worcester, uh, Springfield, and Pittsfield. These were all kind of mill towns in the 19th century and, and partially going into the 20th century. And so there was an enormous uh, Irish American and Irish immigrant community uh, living in those places. And, um, you know, it, people tend to think of Boston as being kind of the only place where, where things matter. In actual fact, all of those places uh, were very active and played an important role, I think, in kind of putting together a response and then responding with kind of a plan of action uh, in, in the wake of the, uh, the Irish rising. And it's also interesting to me to see some of the Irish organizations back in 1916 that were involved, starting, of course, with the AOH, but also a whole number of other 
uh, organizations, some of which are still around today. The Charitable Irish Society was weighing in back then. Uh, Clan the Gale, I think, is still around. Uh, the GAA uh, was, was, was having some words about it. And then there were a lot of other Irish organizations that have kind of come and gone. One of the big ones at the time was uh, the United Irish League, which was sort of a middle class establishment group that was more aligned with, let's say, the Catholic Church than it would have been with mill workers and people who were, at that time, more interested in workers' rights and more, a more a progressive frame of mind than the establishment per se. And that's, maybe that's where I'll begin the talk, and that's kind of to set up for you the way things existed in the months leading up to uh, 1916, April 1916. I feel like there was kind of a, an equilibrium in the Irish community um, about, about Ireland. On one side of the spectrum, you had kind of the establishment view of people who um, were all for the Home Rule movement. The Home Rule movement, of course, had been around since the 1880s, and that was kind of a parliamentary, uh, diplomatic movement that would convince England to give Ireland more freedom to, to run its affairs. So uh, by the time 1916 began to roll around, this movement was 35 years in the making. And as all of us know from Irish history, you know, fraught with disappointments and, and deception from, from the British government every step of the way. But at the same time, you know, it was a legitimate point of view. Um, nobody really wanted to see bloodshed and innocent people dying. So the notion of a constitutional process forward to free Ireland was, was a pretty rational and measured uh, point of view. But on the other hand, uh, and then the other side of the spectrum of this equilibrium, um, you had the physical force advocates and the people who, let's say, were much more impatient than the home rulers. Uh, they had seen these things come and go, it had been passed down through their family for generations, and frankly, they were, they were not willing to wait any longer. So um, it's a tradition that, go, that went back, it goes back centuries, but in our context, it goes back to the Irish Republican Brotherhood of the 1850s, which, as you know, had a real prominent role up here in the Merrimack Valley with uh, Timothy Deasy and, and others, and that's kind of the, the, the predecessor of the Irish Republican Army, the IRA. So the IRB was the first kind of physical force movement in America, um, and they did some, some pretty interesting things in their time. You know, there was one point where uh, they collected all the Civil War soldiers after the American Civil War, and they tried to invade Canada. I think you know about that. Uh, that, was, that didn't work out uh, in their favor. But they were also raising a lot of money and sending armaments back to England. So, that's the other side of the spectrum that we're dealing with in 1915, in, uh, 1916. Now, the equilibrium began to shift a little bit at the onset of World War I. Um, up to World War I, you know, the home rulers led by John Redman were making a pretty good effort to kind of push the British and get them to, to figure this out. But as soon as World War I broke out in August of 1914, all bets were off. So the home rule movement that Redmond and others had so carefully moved up the field was suddenly sidelined. It was, put, it, was, it was taken out of the conversation. And the British point of view was, we're not even going to talk about home rule until we've defeated the Germans. And we don't know how long that's going to be, but we're in the middle of World War I here. Uh, we can't afford to deal with the Irish problem, so we're going to put that aside. So they put it aside in 1914, 1915. Um, they put it aside until the end of the war, obviously. And this is where, to my mind, uh, John Redmond made perhaps one of the worst political judgments uh, in, in Irish history up to that time. Redmond was sort of a brilliant parliamentarian from County Wexford. He was sort of a wonderkind, a uh, bit of a genius in his 20s. He took over the mantle from Charles Stuart Parnell very great speaker, impassioned speaker. He almost single-handedly kept the home rule movement alive for, for 35 years. But when he found out that he was sidelined by the outbreak of the war, I feel like he had a couple of choices to make. 
Um, and the choice he made was, and, and I'll try to explain the logic. The logic was basically, okay, uh, all our work is sort of neutralized at the moment. The very best we can hope to do is to help to end this war quickly. So what he ended up doing was actively recruiting Irish men and, and young boys, uh, 16 and over, to join the British Army to fight in the war against Germany. And so his logic was, we need to align with our enemy so we can get the war over. And the English people are going to be so impressed and gratified by our sacrifice that they're going to give us home rule. I don't know what to say. Looking back, you can see the, the faultiness of, of the logic. But I think at the time, there was a value to it and, and merit to it. And that's what happened. John, um, he kind of got appropriated by the, by the British government. And he almost became a spokesman in favor of the war. This is a guy who was supposed to be opposed to, to British rule in, in Ireland. And his position became increasingly untenable, especially in 1915. Uh, you know, nobody knew the war was going to drag on. When it became apparent it was going to be on for a long time, um, uh, the Irish in Dublin especially were facing a number of problems. One, there was two choices for an Irish man at the time. You could either join the war and take your chances, or you could be unemployed in Ireland. Uh, so there was a great uh, deal of unemployment. There was a lot of poverty, especially in Dublin, but also in the country. And matters worse, the British began to put surcharges and tariffs on, uh, on a lot of goods to raise money for the war effort. So you had this population who was unemployed and poor being taxed, um, and their only outlet was to go, go to the war. And then as things began to get noisy and loud and aggravated, uh, the British, uh, and they've done this many times in history, but they, they enacted a Defense of the Realm Act. And Defense of the Realm is used by many nations in wartime. And it basically says, if there's any sedition or any um, you know, traitors in the midst, we've got, to, we've got to step on that right away. But they used it, as very often uh, governments do, they, they went overboard with it. So any time there was, um, for example, newspapers writing against the war effort, uh, the British would just shut down the newspaper. And I think I was at the BPL trying to read up on this. I think during World War I, about 60 uh, Irish newspapers were shut down because they were speaking out against the war effort. Um, at the same time, the government was able to uh, deport people that it didn't want or prevent people from coming in or to imprison people that they suspected might be uh, seditious. So it was a very, very bad environment uh, over on the Ireland side. Now, on the American side, um, you had a couple of things happening at the same time. One, you had this sort of robust Irish-American community you know, James Michael Curley uh, had come into power. He was the mayor of Boston at the time. John Fitzgerald had just been mayor. The Irish had actually come of age in Massachusetts, and they were taking over the spots uh, that, that, you know, the Brahmins had prevented them from taking for so many years. I think Lawrence had his first Irish mayor maybe in the early 1880s, so it was way ahead of the curve. I think his name was John Green. John Green. 82, yeah, because Hugh O'Brien was 84 in Boston. So I think Green might have been the first one to kind of break that glass ceiling, as we would call it now. But everywhere in Massachusetts, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a more robust kind of activism on the part of the Irish immigrants. They were kind of feeling their oats and their power, and they were, you know, they were used to having workers' uh, uh, strikes and rebellions, especially in the mill towns. So there was a little bit of a progressive, radical uh, edge, I feel, to the Irish American community here in Massachusetts uh, and, and maybe in America generally. And so you could see this impatience. If you look at the literature leading up to that time, you could, you could actually feel that the Irish Americans were really kind of getting annoyed with, with what was going on. And so in March of 1916, the month before the, the rising, um, 
a group of people from around the country met in New York and they formed the Friends of Irish Freedom. It would happen to be on Robert Emmett's birthday on March 4th. And the Friends of Irish Freedom was this kind of radical, confident, well-funded uh, organization that was basically saying, hey, we're not waiting around to the end of the war and for home rule to come back on the table. We want to get this stuff going now and we're going to use our power in the U.S. Uh, and we're going to try to get the United States government, which hadn't entered the war yet, we're going to try to get the U.S. government to help us solve the Ireland problem. And so uh, that's what happened. And all these people were involved. James Michael Curley was involved. Cardinal uh, O'Connell from Boston was involved, which was kind of interesting. There were two or three um, uh, cardinals involved in the, in the race. So it, it had a legitimate end to it and sort of a conservative end, but it also had this sort of progressive, no-nonsense approach that it was going to solve the problem, kind of in an American sort of spirit, you know, that American way where like, darn it, we're just going to, we're going to fix this problem. And that was the mentality back then. And so interestingly, a week before the Irish uprising on April 24th, the Friends of Irish Freedom had its first meeting at Faneuil Hall in Boston. And all these people came out, and there were a lot of kind of angry rhetoric and, and uh, a lot of uh, promises made and uh, they, they were basically gearing up the population to kind of take this on. It was like, we're not going to take this anymore type of mentality. Uh, at the same time, the home rulers, they kind of had an establishment thing and they were trying to hold the party line for John Redman. John Redman continued to kind of hold his ground in Dublin and he had advocates here in, in, in uh, the states who were doing the same. And I think the United Irish League was probably the, 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 uh, the most prominent. The only way I can liken it, and I, this might not be a good comparison, but it would almost be like the American Ireland Fund and Irish Norade in the 70s and 80s. You know, two different, two different groups, the American Ireland Fund wealthy patrons. They had Ireland in their heart and they wanted to do the right thing, but no way were they interested in kind of jeopardizing their status or their money or, or and they didn't want bloodshed. Whereas Norade in the 70s was a much more radicalized group, uh, appealed to working class people, appealed to that section of, of society that's often unemployed. So you had that dynamic really at play here in the uh, in the weeks and days leading up to the, to the Irish Rising. The AOH was kind of an interesting uh, group that was caught in the middle because as you know, uh, a lot of the AOH were among the most progressive and radical. Uh, they, support, they would have supported uh, the Irish Republican Brotherhood me, uh, movement at various times. But they were also distinctly Catholic, which means that you know, they, they had to keep in mind the viewpoint and the perspective of the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church was, you know, relatively uh, conservative as it needed to be, I think, at the time. And um, uh, it, it all came to a head, um, you know, when the rebellion broke out in 1916. I think you all know the backstory to that, but briefly, you know, it was a rebellion that they tried to cancel because the arms from Germany hadn't come through and, and Roger Caseman had been captured and um, this guy Owen McNeil tried to cancel the uprising. But James Conley and uh, Porrick Pierce and a few other people said, oh, let's just go ahead with it. Let's, let's carry it out anyway, albeit with a much smaller uh, group of, of people. Uh, because at this point, I think they felt that it was important to make the gesture. Uh, I don't think they had any hope of winning or taking over the British government or, or undermining Dubl Dublin Castle, uh, but they did want to make that gesture. So a portion of them, the more radical element uh, of, of the movement went ahead and, and, and did it. And so I found some really good quotes uh, in the days after the, uh, uh, the rising. I just want to read to you. One thing to say, and this goes back to the, the way the world works, and that is, uh, you know, William Kennedy had a, a great line, the Irish American novelist from Albany, he said, don't ever pick a fight with someone who buys ink by the barrel, which is to say, if you're gonna take on a newspaper, 
you know, you better be careful. And the same can be said with government and, and, and you know, the, the wealthy class, um, but especially the government. So when the, when the, uh, the rising occurred on, on Monday morning, the day after Easter uh, 1916, and they went to the post office, um, nobody was really sure what was going on. I mean, we didn't have the communications that we had today, so a lot of it was firsthand kind of uh, understanding. But the very evening after it happened, uh, the British and Dublin Castle had already put together a statement that they released to Associated Press, which was around at the time, AP. So uh, the next day in the Boston Globe, uh, there was an interesting little commentary. Uh, in the course of the day, soldiers arrived from the Curra, and the situation is now well in hand. That was, that was the statement. As if to say, yeah, it's just another Irish, you know, up, you know mess of, of, of a couple of thugs, and we put that down, no problem. And the uh, Dublin Castle continued to send out these missiles every day as the fighting, I think the fighting took place for six or seven days. The Republic newspaper, which was run by John Fitzgerald, Honey Fitz, uh, the grandfather of JFK, was kind of a conservative uh, guy by then, and he was, uh, uh, he issued an editorial that said, mischievous work of the Sinn Feiners in Dublin, and uh, the editorial called it an act of folly and political lunacy. And if you look at the globe from that whole week, um, you see that every single article, and, and they were coming out daily, uh, was against the uprising. And people were appalled, and they were, they were angry about it. Um, five days into it, so that would have been the Friday, uh, April 29th, the, the globe ran an official statement of John Redmond, who had put together his own statement. And he called it an insane movement uh, that would return Ireland to another long night of slavery, incalculable st suffering and weary, uncertain struggling. And the Boston chapter of the United Irish League immediately sent him a cablegram, which was the way to correspond in those days. It said, uh, yeah, there's no doubt of Irish sentiment in Boston. We ardent ardently support you and the party. So. Redmond's in, in Ireland trying to hold it all together. He's got his commissioner in Boston saying, yeah, we're with you all the way. Um, and the, the articles in the Globe continued along that for the rest of the week. And then, just out of the blue, George Bernard Shaw, the great uh, writer uh, who, was, who was Irish, but who was really British as well, he wrote a long-winded um, op-ed in the Boston Globe that they published. And uh, he criticized the, uh, the rising as silly, ignorant, and wrong-headed. But at the end of the article, it's almost as if you could see the shift in sentiment coming from writers and other people who were thinking about it. So he called it silly, ignorant, wrong-headed, but also honorable, brave, and Republican. So you've got George Bernard Shaw suddenly into the, into the mix, trying to turn it, uh, put the opinion down. And that was kind of the point of view at that intersection. But by then, uh, by the end of the week, uh, through cables and through the Irish American newspapers in New York, Gaelic American and the Irish World, two great weekly papers, uh, they reached Boston by the end of the weekend and the Irish communities began to have uh, a broader context for what was going on. Uh, then on May 1st, the Boston Globe actually published the entire Ar Irish proclamation in full. It, it, it ran the whole thing. And uh, for the first time in Boston, I think regular people began to say, okay, there's a, there's a context here and, and now we know why, why they did that. Um, so by then, the, the Irish communities in Massachusetts had just reached this fever pitch, and they had what they called indignation meetings all around the state. They had them in Lawrence and Lowell. They had them in Boston. There was one in Boston on, uh, at the Tremont uh, Temple on, Tre on Tremont Street uh, that James Michael Curley spoke at, and they jammed 5,000 people into the, into the temple, and there were another 4,000 spilling out into the Boston Common. So you can imagine uh, Boston at that time, with all these 
infuriated Irish people, you know, chanting against the British. And the thing I mentioned earlier about the, the German uh, connection started to come into play. There was an old maxim in Irish politics, and it was first articulated by Maud Gaughan when she came to uh, this country in 1900. And the maxim was, England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity. Uh, another way of saying that is England's enemies would be Ireland's friends. So there was kind of a strange gravitation of the Irish Americans towards the, Ger the German point of view. You actually had Irish American organizations backing the Kaiser in the war, in World War I. Because they were hoping that the Germans would defeat the English, and they could cut a, they, it's almost as if they felt it would be better to cut a deal with the Germans than it would with the English. So it's almost like the friends you don't know are better than the friends you know, I suppose, just to inverse that. Um, but the indignation meeting spread all through the states, uh, all through the, the Commonwealth. Uh, as I said, Lawrence and Lowell, all the cities I mentioned, all the mill towns. <clears throat> And then when the British began to execute the leaders of the rebellion, I think starting around May 5th or 6th, um, the Irish community just, just absolutely went crazy and the, and, and the meetings continued. And, and um, there was an interesting one by, um, and it wasn't only the political groups, it was like the Boston Gaelic School, which taught children how to read and speak Gaelic, um, somehow held a, a an event on Washington Street in Boston. Um, and the pulpit, I'm reading from the Globe here, the pulpit was draped with an Irish flag and a white banner of mourning with the word vengeance written in big black letters. And then Matthew Cummings, the head of the Gaelic school, um, just, just roaring into the crowd, you know, no Irishman with red blood in his veins will rest content until England has been destroyed. So that was the sentiment you had in, in Boston. Because one of the things about Boston that was interesting um, is so many of the, the uh, people in the rebellion and several of the ones who were executed had actually been to Boston many times. They had been here speaking and they had been here visiting because it was a large Irish community. So James Conley, for example, the socialist worker in the Irish, uh, the Irish Army, Citizens Army, um, had been to Boston many times. He first came in 1902. 14 years before the rising. He spoke at Faneuil Hall, and he was, you know, at that time there was a workers' rights movement, there was some socialism kind of coming up from Germany and, and Russia, and there was just, uh, you know, everything was taking shape at that time. And Conley was an avowed socialist, and his point of view was, yeah, it's, you know, we gotta get rid of, of, of uh, you know, the Brits for sure, but we also have to reform a lot of things, including the American workplace, so that people have uh, uh, better opportunities. So Conley was here. Um, my friend, uh, Father Sean McManus in DC, the Irish caucus, uh, told me once that Conley had actually lived in Boston for uh, several months. He lived in Mission Hill in Roxbury. <laughs> uh, and that wouldn't have been unusual because when, when Irish when Irish leaders were coming to the States, um, it's like being an Australian now. You get here, you've got to stay for at least six months. I mean, you can't just be going back and forth. So the Irish would come, and they would, they would stay here sometimes for a whole year. So it wouldn't have been out of the ordinary for a guy like James Conley to, you know, go down to Roxbury, which was a large Irish community at the time, and just live there. Another union leader that came through actually in 1915 was James Larkin. He spoke at the Tremont uh, Temple, and the Globe described him in retrospect after he was captured. More of a poet and an idealist than a red-handed agitator. So the red hand has to do with, with the, the socialist stuff. And there was a really interesting guy that came over also in 1915. He might have come up this way. I, I found that he was in Boston and also Worcester, so he was probably moving around. His name was Francis Sheehy Dash Skeffington. He was um, a well known writer and poet, a little bit of a mystic in that William Butler Yeats kind of school. Um, and uh, I have him uh, coming to Worcester and talking about uh, suffrage rights, women's rights, 
uh, Irish independence, and vegetarianism. Go figure. <laughs> so clearly not a threat to the, to the empire, as far as I can tell. Uh, but he was in, he was in Boston uh, in Worcester the, the year before the uprising. And he ended up, uh, on the very first night of the uprising in Dublin, he was one of those guys who was going out into the street trying to get people in for the curfew, you know, trying to keep the British soldiers from, from breaking down doors. And uh, he was picked up on the very first night, thrown into prison. And the very next morning, uh, one of the English soldiers who later turned out to be mentally insane, took him out into the backyard and shot him. So he was the first kind of notable casualty of, of the uprising. He just got shot right on the spot. And then the British, because everything was in motion and there was just you know, anarchy going on, the British authorities tried to cover up that killing. So for several days, they wouldn't tell his wife where he was, and they couldn't find him. And then eventually somebody cracked, and they told him, and he was buried in a little courtyard uh, behind where he had been staying. <clears throat> and I'll tell you more about that in a little, a little bit, because that comes back to Boston somehow. But meanwhile, you know, earlier the cablegram, just like a week earlier, the cablegram from the United Ireland League was saying, yeah, we're with you, you know, Redmond, Mr. Redmond, we're, we're all behind you. At a rally in Pittsfield that summer, um, Justice Daniel Cohan from New Jersey came up, and here's what he said about Redmond. He said, can one imagine a more contemptible figure than John Redmond? Lost to all sense of decency, he alone has been acting as a chief recruiting sergeant for England and Ireland. But now, in the hour of crisis, he calls upon his deluded followers to take part with England's gunmen in shooting down their fellow countrymen who are fighting for freedom. So it's interesting how it was suddenly framed. John Redmond was trying to kind of hold on to kind of the status quo, but suddenly this judge from New Jersey is saying, not only is there no status quo, but now you're a traitor to the Irish cause because of your behavior here. So that kind of thing was going on um, uh, all through the summer. Now, interestingly enough, it so happens that the ancient order of, uh, of Hibernians was holding its national convention in the city of Boston that July. The ancient order of Hibernians at the time had 250,000 members across the country. It was by far the most significant Irish-American organization. It had, had a lot of heft to it. It had chapters everywhere, including uh, Merrimack Valley, certainly, all over Boston. Uh, Hibernian Hall in Roxbury on Dudley Street was, was an AOH hall originally. Um, so all these Hibernians from around the country arrive in Boston, and you know they're furious. And they send out a telegram to uh, the Prime Minister of England, England. And they write to him, let's see if I can find that, yeah. His name was uh, Prime Minister Asquith. He was the Prime Minister at the time. Here's what it said. The National Convention of the AOH in convention assembled at Boston, Mass, USA, 250,000 members, and representing the Irish in America do protest the hanging of Sir Roger Casement as an act of inhumanity that the Irish people can never forget and never forgive. Further, the hanging of said Casement must be accepted by the Irish people as an act of hate and not of justice. So you began to see that that equilibrium I talked about earlier had been just shattered. There was nothing left of that in equilibrium. Practically everybody you, you talked to, including the AOH, which was always kind of a measured tending towards the conservative side, you know, we're basically saying we're never for, going to forgive you for that, for what happened. There were other interesting things I found in my research. Um, one was that the Boston Symphony Orchestra performed a fundraising concert uh, for the widows and orphans uh, in Dublin. I think it was in July. And uh, it was a 50-person orchestra, and they played at Symphony Hall. They opened the concert with Beethoven's March, uh, appropriately called Dead Heroes. So it almost seems that even mainstream America was now understanding that the revolution and the rebellion 
was not a bad thing. And it was the British who had uh, messed up. In the week right after the, uh, the, uh, the Easter uh, Rising, that was turned completely on its head. Everybody was condemning the, uh, the, the rebels. Once they got executed and once more information came out, the tables were turned. And that's significant because that would, that would point to the kind of activism that came out of the Rising for the next several years that led to um, you know, the 1921-22 Civil War and then Ireland becoming uh, a free state for the first time in its history from, from England. There's one other thing that I want to mention that was, that was kind of interesting, um, and that is, you know, it, it really was a propaganda battle between the authorities and the regular folk. And so in the summer of 1916, you had the AOH in, in Boston with 250,000 people. Right at the end of the summer, who turns up but James Conley, who was shot. James Conley was one of the people shot in the uh, execution. He had been wounded during the uprising. So in order to execute him, they had to put him in a chair and tie him to the chair so he wouldn't fall off. And then they shot him. So who turns up in Boston but his uh, lovely daughter, Nora Conley, who was 23 years old. <coughs> and she came to tell Americans about uh, what had really happened. There's an interesting thing about the Irish and the American connection that you, know, you can trace back to the 19th century, maybe even the 18th century. But when the Irish leaders came over here, they were looking for three things, I think. Support from established leaders. Um, they were looking to win the PR war battle against the British. And they were looking for funds. They were looking for money for a whole variety of reasons. Those are the three things. Anytime you had someone coming over, uh, if they walked away with all three, it was a successful visit. So Nora comes over to Boston. and. Um, you know, you can tell that the Boston Globe writer is immediately smitten with her. I just want to read you what, what he writes. Uh, his name is M.E. Hennessy. She's a sweet little woman of 23, but she doesn't look over 18. Dressed in black, wearing a large felt picture hat, this little Irish girl tells the story of the uprising and her part in the stirring events with the modesty of a schoolgirl. She is a pronounced brunette. Her features are small, but finely chiseled. She is a charming conversationalist and tells her story in a way that grips the heartstrings. I found that so interesting to kind of read because on, on a number of levels, one was how condescending the reporter was about you know, this, this young woman describing her physical attributes rather than uh, her, her message, although he, he also got to that. But also I think the way the Irish themselves knew that there was a propaganda war going on and they had to use everything in their power to do that. And that included first person uh, witnesses to the, to, to the episode um, and women and, uh, and anybody else. The, the battle for the hearts and minds of, of the American public was, was really um, amazing. Uh, so the couple things about her visit, I'll just tell you quickly. Um, you know, when, when he actually interviewed her and quoted her, it became clear to me at least that she was certainly not as demure and, and kind of fragile as she seemed. Uh, she basically said, you know, the Irish people in Dublin today, uh, they don't fear to speak of English of Easter week. They sing it loud and shout it defiantly at English soldiers on the street and they're willing to suffer the consequences. So she's basically saying that when she walks down the street in, in Dublin and sees a British soldier, she starts giving him a, a load of crap. And she's singing rebel songs and she's telling him to go home. So it was a great message for Americans to understand because it, it demonstrated that the Irish certainly didn't feel uh, defeated. In the 19th century, there was a movement that basically said all of the people with Irish names in the Revolutionary War were not really Irish, they were actually Scots-Irish which is to say they had come from Scotland to Ulster and then they had moved to America. It didn't matter that they were in Ulster for you know, several generations. They were originally from Scotland. So we can't give the Irish any credit for anything that happened in the Revolutionary War. 
And this became kind of a serious kind of debate in certain circles. And Joseph Smith, who I guess was pretty intellectual and, and articulate, was one of the first people to kind of challenge that supposition. The way he comes into uh, the Easter Rising is kind of interesting, too. Um, he was one of the founders of the Friends of Irish Freedom in New York. He was kind of the Massachusetts guy on the ground, let's say, or Eastern Mass. There was a guy named, uh, there was a guy in Pittsfield who was also big. His name might have been Kelly. Uh, but Joseph was one of the founders, so he would have organized that Faneuil Hall Friends of Irish Freedom event that took place. And uh, he was going to all the rallies, and he was a great speaker, and he got the crowd riled up. And by July, so three months after the rising, the Friends of Irish Freedom had raised $100,000 that it was going to send to the widows and orphans in Dublin. And normally they would have just maybe cabled it over or sent it an emissary over, but they decided that they were going to take the money literally in their suitcases and, and bring it over. And here's, here's why, here's what happened. Um, John McCormick, the great singer, had, had uh, put on a number of concerts in Boston and uh, New York right after the, the Easter Rising. And they had raised $25,000. They sent the money back to Dublin for the widows and orphans of the people who had been killed or injured. <coughs> Apparently what happened was the Lord Mayor of Dublin, to whom the money was sent, distributed among the widows, orphans, and dependents of the English soldiers who aided them in putting down the rebellion. So you can see that even after the rebellion, Dublin Castle was still pretty much intact. And so the Lord Mayor of Dublin, who you assume, as, as, the, as the Americans did, would be sympathetic, he turns the money over to the English uh, soldiers. So these guys were just outraged. So Smith says, all right, I'm going to take the money over in a briefcase. And, and uh, sure enough, they left New York. It was uh, Joseph Smith. There was a guy named McClure and a guy named Kelly from New York. And the three of them got on the US Philadelphia uh, around July 18th. And they sailed to uh, Liverpool. And then they were going to go to Dublin. And they had 50,000 in their, in their suitcase. The other 50 was, was going to come later. And uh, the British wouldn't let them get off the boat. They invoked the Defense of the Realm Act, which said that anybody who you know, was suspected of being seditious, uh, they, could, they could reject them at the borders. So here's Joseph Smith with a bag full of money, all the way from Lowell, sitting in Liverpool, uh, and, and you know, to the credit of the American side, there was a big kind of diplomatic outburst. Um, I think Henry Cabot Lodge might have been the senator at the time. Uh, he protested. James Michael Curley was writing letters to the, uh, you know, the British ambassador in London, in, in Washington. There was all sorts of stuff. The most that they could get in terms of concession was because the Philadelphia then got delayed and it was in port for like another four or five days. So here's Joseph Smith from Lowell sitting on this boat with a bag full of money. And the only concession that the Ameri Americans could get was that he could get off the boat, go to the American co uh, embassy, uh, or consulate it would have been in Liverpool, and reside there until the boat was ready to leave. But Smith refused to do that. He's like, no way. If I can't go to Dublin, I'm not even, I'm not even gonna deal with you folks. So they sent Joseph Smith back to New York with a bag full of money. And then they had to find uh, a different way of, of getting the money there. Um, so I only give you a glimpse. There's so much more. I know the folks in this room might know a, lot, a whole lot about it as well. But I guess the way I would sum this up is by saying, um, you know, as, as Dave Burke so you know, presently knew in 2006, um, it's important to be part of the narrative that gets created. You have to be part of the narr narrative. You have to be willing to tell the story and you have to take a chance on it because if you're telling a story that's not popular with any government or establishment uh, or influential folks, um, there's a chance that you could be brought down. And I think uh, 
that certainly was happening here in Boston and, and Massachusetts. But I think the offenses created in the rising were so egregious that even the middle of the road guys couldn't, couldn't just sit down on the sidelines and say, well, you know, be patient. Uh, nobody was impatient. And so for the next certainly three years from 18, 1918 until 1921, um, the American involvement and the Boston, Massachusetts involvement in the troubles with Eamon de Valera and Michael Collins and others was really, really significant and, uh, and really led to, um, you know, the treaty and the negotiations that led to an Irish free state in, in, in uh, 1921. Uh, that is a lecture for a different time, though. So thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> so actually what happened was, so Skeffington, uh, you know, people knew him, as I said, from 1915, certainly in Worcester and Boston. And they, they knew about what happened to him. And uh, let me just pull out a quote as well, because it's, it's important. I mentioned Nora Conley came over in August. And uh, she, she really had a, a, an important impact. In October, who shows up in Boston but Mrs. She, Sheehy Skeffington with her nine-year-old son, Owen. OK? They arrive in Boston. What's going on there? She arrived to tell people what was really going on in Dublin with the troubles. She described how her pacifist husband Francis was murdered by the, by the English during the Rising, as I had said, and, uh, and how uh, they tried to cover it up. She also said that when she went to uh, get her passport to come over from Ireland, she got called into the British Embassy. And they said, here's the deal. We're not going to let you go to Ireland or to America if you say anything negative about what happened in the Rising, if you say anything uh, negative about World War I, if you say anything negative about us, we're not going to give you the passport. Now, she could have easily said, OK, you got me, and then turned on it. Instead, she smuggles aboard an American steamer and goes to Boston without the passport with her seven-year-old son, Owen. And um, there's, there's a picture that I saw in the Boston Globe. She's a, you know, a fashionable woman and you know, uh, obviously intense woman. But she also spoke at an overflowing crowd at Faneuil Hall, where she laid out exactly what had happened in April, but more importantly, what had happened since. Because there was a lot of on-the-ground um, problems uh, in Dublin after that. And her prediction was that uh, the English were going to massacre the Irish if, if the Americans didn't do something. So she was another example of the Irish sending over their best emissaries, in this case women, to really tell the story in an unvarnished way and to, uh, to appeal to Americans to, to help out. Yeah. Uh, other than the Irish uh, in Boston and New York, what did uh, other Americans of back, a different background uh, think or support the cause? Yeah. Um, again, it was kind of a mixed uh, bag in a way. Um, for example, the German Americans, of which there was a large population, not so much in Boston anymore, but in the Midwest, um, they also had that premise that you know uh, uh, an enemy of Germany is a friend of, of uh, an, an enemy of Germany is is a friend of theirs. So when the rebellion happened in Ireland, you found the uh, German American population really behind them. Um, you know, in, in Boston there were a lot. It was a mixed thing. There were a lot of mainstream people who were supportive. Like I said, the Boston Symphony Orchestra did the uh, did the charitable thing. But there were a lot of people who weren't, and they became kind of mouthpieces for uh, you know, the British establishment. There was one guy in particular, uh, I have his name in here somewhere, but he was, a, he was a minister at a church in the Back Bay. And I don't know, I describe him as kind of a quirky character because I did a search in the Globe for him, and his name only came up twice. 
and both times he was speaking out against the Irish Rebellion at a, at a you know, at a, at a Protestant church in the Back Bay. And I described him as sort of being uh, a dabbler in the New England Historic Genealogical Society, which at the time, it's on Newbury Street, is a really kind of uh, carefully monitored Brahmin establishment that was looking at people who came over on the Mayflower. So he was one of those kind of guys. But he was outrageous in his accusations. I mean, he went further than it was, the pro it was the fault of the, the Dubliners. He was basically saying that it was the fault of the Americans in places like Boston who were poisoning the minds of impressionable you know, Dublin young men. It wasn't unlike what was happening in the 1980s during the hunger strikes, where you had people coming from Ireland and the UK basically saying, you know, we wouldn't be having any trouble in Belfast if, you know, the IRA affiliates over here weren't raising money and sending money back. It was that same kind of argument. I think the general population, uh, and let's say the readers of the Boston Globe, for example, would have been sympathetic to the Irish uh, and the Irish cause, especially after the executions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was there any um, movement among the Irish community in the Boston area, Massachusetts, or more broadly in the United States to protest against the U.S. getting into the war? I mean, Wilson ran on a platform of not going to war and then fairly yeah. suddenly changed his tune. Um, yeah. were, there any, uh, were there any protests in the Irish community against that? Any pressure? There was. Um, Wilson had never been a favorite of the Irish community um, uh, even before he became president, but uh, they found, and, and he, he also had, I think, pretty strong ancestral ties to maybe the Scots-Irish community, I'm, I'm not sure, um, or, or the English community. Um, but they found it to be very hypocritical that he was talking about the freedom of small nations and, and forming the League of Nations um, when he wouldn't do anything to, to help the Irish. So for example, when that Friends of Irish Freedom formed in March, one of their missions was to go to the, uh, the Capitol and appeal to the legislators and the President and the White House to kind of say something, and Wilson refused to do it. So when he entered the war, I think there were a lot of people who were disappointed. Uh, but as I said earlier, you know, the, the, the impulse of Irish Americans for American patriotism almost always overrides anything else, and I think that, that ended up happening. But having said that, when the war was over and, you know, the League of Nations became kind of a joke, uh, the Irish were able to say, yeah, I told you so. Yeah. Hi. Did you say not much has changed since the uprising and the triangle between the uh, British, the Irish, and, and the U.S.? and the troubles of the uh, 70s in, in Northern Ireland, it seems to be the same kind of propaganda and the same kind of uh, pressure on the British going down on the, uh, uh, on the people in, in Ireland. Uh, yeah. To me, it doesn't seem very much. There's much difference between 1960 and the 70s and the 80s. Yeah, I feel like you, you could have a point there, especially in the 70s and 80s. T today, I would say probably not, but in the, in the 70s and 80s, um, the, there had been so much lip service um, for, for that entire six or seven decades since the Irish Free State. And it was another one of those occasions where in the 70s, there was high unemployment, there was a big recession uh, in, in Europe, but especially in Ireland, I think one point in the 70s, the unemployment was like 29%. So you had the same ingredients at play in Ireland in the 1970s as you had in the, in the 19-teens, which was a disaffected community who, you know, on the ground they could see the discrimination and the, uh, the injustice, the social and economic injustice. And um, I think that, that is one of the reasons why in the 70s and 80s, um, there was there was a rising of a different nature, yeah, definitely. You always find, I think, uh, and I say this working in government myself, uh, but my observation is that any time you have a powerful uh, 
system, whether it's the Catholic Church or, or a government or a corporation, um, it's inevitable that those institutions are going to look after their, their own best interests, even if it doesn't seem fair at the time. And I think that's certainly the case with, with the British government. I mean, it had a fair by then. And in a way, you know, Ireland was almost, you know, like a small thorn on, on the side. Um, but nevertheless, it had to kind of apply, you know, a, a methodology across the board so that you couldn't have these little uprisings taking place uh, anywhere. And that's, I'd say that's still in place today. That's, I think that's human nature. Any other questions? Um, we want to thank everyone for coming, and of course, I think it's very appropriate hearing the story about the, our friend Dave Burke, that he had talked to Mike 10 years ago about this event. I think it's fantastic that you kicked off our lecture series this month, so thank you, Mike, for that, really. That was very appropriate. <laughs> Nancy,